Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Goodness of God. You know, uh, here at Whole Life Church, our mission, you can say it with me if you know it, is to love people into a lifelong friendship with God. And some of you are like, why is he holding up a chip? Is this his one-year sobriety chip? And it is my one year here at, uh, at Whole Life Chip. But on this chip, if you haven't, uh, if you don't have it from last year when I did this sermon series where we talked about our mission, our vision, and our values, I'd love to give it to you today. If you don't have it, go ahead. I keep this one right in my wallet so you can see it's got some wear and tear on it. Um, but I wonder if anybody could, uh, anybody remember, feel like confident, like if I brought a microphone to you, you would be able to tell me what our church values are? Raise your hand if you think you could do it. If somebody, I'm not saying a microphone is going to come to you. I'm just saying if it did, you think you could tell me what our church values are. Anybody? Anybody? I guess I'll just keep the t-shirt then. Is that, is that the way it's going to be? Wow. I guess I'm going to have to do that whole series again, Jeff. I don't know what to do about that. Um, but what I will do about it right now is tell you that our values here at Whole Life are love. Just feel free to say it with me if you know. Love, love. acceptance, acceptance. Forgiveness. forgiveness, grace, grace. the Bible, Bible. Worship. worship, and participation. And if you're having a hard time remembering that, it's because you don't have a chip that you get out every day and look at. So I have some up here for you. And we, we only talk about that because it's important. We are only are able to live the values that we spend time thinking about if we're going to be intentional. Otherwise, we just kind of wander through things. And uh, these values are one of the reasons why we're doing this sermon series. We think it's important to be relevant in the world that we live in. And there is, I don't think, any better communication platform out there for conveying values than movies. Let's be honest, most people watch movies. And it's important if we're going to be watching those movies that we think about the messages that are being sent in those movies. And that if we're going to watch those movies and we're going to have conversations with the world around us, that we're able to point out some of the Christian ideas that can be found in there. There are those who spend a lot of time finding all the non-Christian ideas in there, and there's there's some good thoughts that should be had about what values are being spread in there. But there's also a way to take movies and actually use them to convey the gospel and to share the gospel. And so that's one of the things that we're doing during this month. We are watching a different movie every week. Last week it was uh, Good Night and Good Luck. This week we watched on Tuesday night Inside Out, which is a fabulous, fabulous uh, movie from Pixar. And, uh, and if you weren't here to watch it, let me go ahead and just give you a quick recap of what it's about. Um, this uh, 11-year-old girl, Riley, um, is living in Minnesota. She loves hockey, and all of a sudden her parents decide that they need a transplant for work to San Francisco, and so she's moved. And what we do is we get a picture of what's happening inside of her mind, the emotions that are there in her mind, and you can see them up on the screen. You have sadness, that's the blue Sadness. And then there's the, uh, and then there's fear that looks, you, or you can, you can kind of see that. And then you've got anger. You can probably figure out which one that one is. And then disgust and joy. And so what the movie does is it, it makes a fascinating point about how we should be relating with our emotions. Um, because what happens is, is when Riley moves to San Francisco, her mother inadvertently says something that actually causes some trauma. And as parents, we've all done this to our children, so we can feel bad about it, or we can just know as parents we do the best we can. But what happens is, is Riley's mom says to her, hey, it's really important, Riley, that you be happy for dad, because dad needs us to be supportive of him right now. And so Riley tries to do that. And in her mind, what we see is that joy tries to take over and push sadness away. 
And in the ensuing mayhem, sadness and joy are sent to the outer reaches of Riley's mind. They have to make a journey back to headquarters where fear, disgust, and anger have been left in control, which, by the way, think about that. What happens when we push sadness and joy out of their places? The others take over and become more dominant in our lives. So there's a lot of uh, incredible things uh, to think about in there. And so what we discover through the movie is that, that each emotion has value, in particular as we learn how to properly use those emotions. In fact, one of the true signs of maturity is the ability to understand our emotions and then deal with them appropriately. That's maturity. Maturity isn't ignoring our emotions, it's understanding our emotions, being able to say, this is what I am feeling right now. You know, there's a lot of subtle and maybe not so subtle messages in this movie, but one of the ones that I just have to say, it's uh, just a sub thing here that I just find uh, very fun, <laughs> is there are no wasted scenes in this movie that I can tell. Each, everything is used to do something. And one of my favorite things that, that happens is that uh, we, we get introduced to Riley's imaginary friend. As she's 11 years old, that imaginary friend has been pushed further and further into the back of her mind. And I won't ruin it if you haven't seen the movie, but go watch it and cry. But anyway, um, and so, uh, so the imaginary friend is actually helping joy and sadness find their way back to headquarters. And, uh, and so the, the uh, imaginary friend is part elephant, part dolphin, part, I don't know, there's a bunch of other things. Anyway, and so uh, Bing Bong is his name. And so they're about to get on a train. Just check this out. There's the train. Oh, we made it. We're finally going to get home. Oh, no. These facts and opinions look so similar. Ah, don't worry about it. it happens all the time. I just love that one. I, I'll be honest with you, that one got by me the first time I watched it. Um, I didn't really remember, but isn't that, isn't that such a subtle but true fact? Facts and opinions get dumped out in our mind, and then we tend to shovel them back and not really sort out which one's really opinion and which one's fact. In fact, most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, will admit that our opinions are facts and everybody else's opinions are their opinions, unless they agree with our opinions, which then they become facts. Am I right? I'm right. I know I am. <laughs> That's my opinion, and it's a fact. See what I did there? Yeah, all right. Yeah. We're having fun this morning, aren't we? All right. But the main message of this movie is the importance of understanding our emotions and that all emotions are important and play a part in our life. Now, what I think is really significant that we really ought to think about a little bit is that most of us want the emotion of joy in our life. It is the emotion that we want to feel. Why? Because it makes us feel good. And so we tend to do what joy does to sadness in this next clip. Check it out. Sadness, I have a super important job just for you. Really? Mm-hmm. Follow me. What are you doing? And there. Perfect. This is the circle of sadness. Your job is to make sure that all the sadness stays inside of it. So, you want me to just stand here? Hey, it's not my place to tell you how to do your job. Just make sure that all the sadness stays in the circle. See? You're a pro at this. Isn't this fun? No. Adam. I say that, but if we're honest with it, don't we do that in our lives? We draw a circle and say sadness needs to stay here. We're going to church. Don't want to be sad, let people know I'm sad. Or <laughs> I don't want them to know that I'm angry when I get out of the car because I've been, you know, tussling with my kids all morning long trying to get them ready for church, right? Or my spouse. I don't want people to know that I feel disgusted, and we tend to draw these circles around emotions and say, hey, this has to stay here, and I'm not going to let it out. And it's bad enough when we do that where we don't let other people see it, but it's even worse when we actually don't admit it to ourselves. If you remember many, many sermons ago, I used a quote that said, if you can name it, you can tame it. 
And so if you cannot name fear in your life, you can't tame it. If you can't name anger in your life, you can't tame it. And dare I suggest that sometimes it's appropriate to also tame joy. There is a time and a place, and we want joy, but there is a time and place for joy to not be center stage. And I know this is difficult for most of us as Christians, right? Because as Christians, we've been taught something very important. Being angry is bad, right? Being, being disgusted is bad. Fear is bad. And we've slapped a big old sin label on top of these emotions, right? We've slapped that label right on top and said, that's sinful. Don't do it. And we try not to do it. And if we see other people in our church who are struggling, we say, you know, the Bible says 365 times in the Bible it's recorded, be not afraid. Have you guys heard that one before? You heard that? By the way, you do know that's not true, right? If you don't believe me, just type in in quotes on BibleGateway.com, be not afraid. It will not come up 365 times. Because the, 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 the thing behind that story is, oh, it's once for every day of the year. See how... But I want to suggest to you today that our emotions are not sinful. What we do with them can become sinful, but the emotion itself is not necessarily sinful. Why would I believe that? Well, dare I say that you are made in the image of God. And when you are made in the image of God, it is talking far more about what's up here than what you look like physically. Why can I say that with confidence? Because God is spirit. And so if we're created in his image, it's our spirit that mirrors his. Well, at least before sin entered. But some would say, well, that's what sin did. It puts in all these negative emotions. But today I want you to really think a little bit deeper about this. Yes, there are negative emotions. Yes, there are positive emotions, but that doesn't necessarily mean that negative emotions are bad and that positive emotions are good and never bad. I know that's a real subtle nuance, but I want you to just let that settle on you and think about it through the day. I'm not going to go too much further with that, but let's go ahead and use one metaphor that I hope will help you understand it a little bit more. Is pain bad? I don't like pain. It's negative. But I'll tell you what, it would be a bad, bad thing if you could not feel pain in the world that we live in. It would be a terrible thing. Because when you put your hand on something hot, you wouldn't know to move it. When you felt, if you didn't feel that pain in your abdomen, you wouldn't know that your appendix is about to explode. If you didn't feel that pain in your tooth, you wouldn't know that you need to get that tooth removed or at least get to a dentist to have them look at it because if you don't, it's going to create bigger health problems for you. So pain is actually not bad. We don't like pain, but it sends us important messages. And the same thing is true with our emotions. Anger tells us something's happening, that we don't think something's fair and right in the world. Fear tells us, beware, watch out, You're, you could be in danger. Disgust tells us there's something not right also. Our emotions are there to teach us things. And lest we think, well, but that's us humans, What emotions did Jesus experience? By the way, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we can assume that if Jesus experienced these emotions, God experiences them. So let's just use one example for each one of these different emotions. At that time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. We're all good, yeah? It's good. Jesus feeling joy, that's we're all good with that. Ooh, but then Jesus wept when Lazarus passed away. And by the way, this was about five minutes before Jesus was going to raise him back to life. Think about that. And think about that the next time you tell somebody not to be sad because somebody they cared about passed away because they're going to be raised at the resurrection. 
Jesus cried five minutes before he's about to resurrect somebody. So clearly being sad is not a reaction necessarily to the idea that you're not going to see someone ever again, but it's a reaction to the, to the pain that comes with separation from somebody you care about. It comes from seeing other people that are suffering. How about this? When Jesus saw her weeping, when Jesus, this is again at Lazarus' tomb, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Again, go to BibleGateway.com and type in the word God and anger and see how many times it pops up. Again, it's what you do with it that makes the difference. All right, so Jesus said, you faithless, corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. If you don't know the context of this, uh, the disciple, Jesus had just gone up on this mountain and uh, Moses, Elijah had shown up. Jesus, was, his appearance was changed and he's there with Peter, James, and John. Meantime, the other nine disciples are at the bottom of the mountain feeling really upset that they got left out. Who do they think they are? They're not better than us. We're, we're great too. But, but, and they're having this discussion. And in the meantime, a crowd approaches. A man who has a son who, who is experiencing demon possession shows up. And these disciples are like, oh, they're in the middle of thinking about themselves. And they try to go ahead and cast this demon out. And, and it doesn't happen. And later on, Jesus said, because it takes time and prayer. You have to fast and pray for this kind of thing. And the thing is that Jesus feels disgusted. He said, when you, we read this, it's like, well, that's kind of harsh, Jesus. But Think about it. Jesus thinks, how long do I have to stay with you? How long until my people stop worrying about themselves and their greatness and start thinking about God's kingdom? Disgust. Come on. Now, I know this is the hard one. This is the hard one for me. Does God ever feel fear? I really wrestle with this. And I know it's not proper for a pastor to say he doesn't have an answer, but I'm not sure. But when I read Luke chapter 22, verse 42 and 44, with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, it resonates to me with fear. Not fear of lack of faith in God, but just a knowledge of that there's going to be some suffering ahead, and none of us look forward to suffering. You know, one of God's greatest heroes, people like Elijah, Job, David, Peter, John, and Paul, we see them all experiencing the full range of emotions. Some of them experience deep anxiety and depression. And what we never hear is God saying, if you don't stop that, I'm going to leave you. In fact, what we see is just the reverse. As they suffer, as they go through depression, God draws close. Not that they always experienced it. Job didn't experience God drawing close. He felt alienated. He couldn't figure out what he'd done wrong. And again, too many times our, our, our response is the same response that Job's friends kind of gave to him. is like, well, you've done something. And if you haven't, you shouldn't be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. Doesn't God say to fear not a lot? He does say to fear not a lot. But I think that maybe we ought to rehear that command in a different context. The way I always heard it growing up, was don't be afraid. What's wrong with you faithless generation of people? Have faith, buck up, and, and trust me. Get it together. Instead of hearing it the way that my parents would say it to me when I had a nightmare, hey, Ken, I'm here. You don't have to be afraid. I understand why you're afraid, but I want you to know I'm here with you, and it's going to be okay. I'm here with you. When we hear God say, fear not, it's a reminder of his presence, not a, a rebuke. And so as you experience fear, know that God is with you in that fear. He's walking with you. He wants to be with you. For me, the most, my favorite scene in this whole movie is the one I'm going to show you right now. And the reason is because I'm the type of person, if you're, if you're sad, my natural desire is to cheer you up. I want you to be happy again. Let me, what do I need to do? And one of the things I've really had to work on and I continue to work on as a pastor is to do something different. To not make the focus of making you feel good so I feel better, but to be with you in the moment. 
Hey, it's going to be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. Hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness. It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. One of the things I love so much about that scene is that it just conveys the importance of presence. To not telling somebody, don't feel that way. We've all done that though, right? Don't feel that way. But they do feel that way. Let's talk about why you feel that way. How can I be with you there? How can I experience that with you? I love it that that's what God does with us. The Bible calls him repeatedly God with us because he's with us in our experiences in life. You know, I felt a little bit of pressure on this sermon because my daughter told me, she said, this is my favorite movie. You better do a good job with the sermon. Don't mess it up. And uh, there's so much richness and texture. There's so many biblical lessons that we can pull out of it. I thought it'd be way better to have a conversation with you and with some of my friends here. And so what we're going to do is now is just invite you to engage with us. So you can, you can go online to wholelife.church slash live, and there's a, a text box that you can put questions or comments into. Uh, you can do that. Um, we also have Randy. Randy, where are you at? Can I get you? He's standing in the back. He's waving his hand. If you want to ask a question or make a comment um, about this topic, um, please do. Just raise your hand. Randy's going to come up. He'll go ahead and uh, bring the mic to you. He's going to have you tell you his, your question first. We're going to do a little bit of screening just to make sure that we stay on topic. Um, but uh, but uh, so Randy will bring that microphone. Just tell him your question and then, uh, and then you can go off topic after that. Um, but I want to start this off um, with a conversation with my friends here. Each one of them has a different perspective on this movie based on their background. And Stanley, I want to start with, start with you. You're a filmmaker. What do you think you notice in this movie that maybe the rest of us might miss? Well, um, it's a very uh, rich tapestry of a film. There's a lot to look at. Um, but one of the things I notice is that in filmmaking, there's a bit of a rule, and it's called everybody changes except the villain. And what that means is the reason we're watching a movie is to watch a character go through a change. Um, and usually it's the villain is indicated by, uh, especially in animation, because there's so much detail put into the whole process of filmmaking with an animated film. But a villain in an animated film often is depicted as one with the smallest mm -hmm. eyes. Um, and now if you looked at the group photo of all of the emotions, you'll notice that sadness, although still has cartoony eyes, has very small eyes but she also has very large glasses. And this is often an indicator that there's knowledge or there's, uh, we're gonna learn something more, they're a smart or wise character, but it's basically there to indicate that she's a villain uh, in that subtle sense, but also to show that she has a bigger view of the world than we realize. Um, and so in this film, sadness never changes. She's the villain to, to joy it, and she never changes, but yet, that she doesn't need to change is what we learn. And that's what Joy learns. And when you really look at it, Joy is actually the villain of this film. Everything that goes wrong is because of Joy's decisions. She's a little bit manipulative, she's controlling, but it's actually mostly Joy's fault and she has to come to realize that. 
Uh, and there's beautiful subplots like with Bing Bong, where Bing Bong goes through the same, uh, almost the same realization of I need to let sadness in and I need to let Riley change and grow and I can't just control everything myself. So it was just a fascinating thing about character and that, uh, in fact, sadness ends up becoming the hero and is really the only emotion that can pull uh, Riley, the girl, out of her kind of dead emotional state ends up being only sadness that can work. So Alicia came up to me after we showed the film on Tuesday night, and she said, I hear you're doing a panel. I would actually like to be on it. And, and she said, I'd like to kind of speak um, from a person who's had um, depression and anxiety in their life, what it meant to me to watch this movie, and the messages that I kind of receive as a Christian with that. So Alicia, kind of give us your perspective of the movie. So I actually first watched Inside Out when it was in the theaters with my friends, and it was at the very peak going through all of these struggles. And at the end, when the control board for her emotions, at the end when it grays out, it made me realize that what I had been doing was trying to shut out every single negative thing to the point where I felt nothing. And letting those negative feelings in was actually the first step to healing, managing all of those emotions, and moving on. And as far as, you know, the Christian perspective, it's, you know, I've been told, well, you just don't have enough Jesus. And that's not true at all. Um, you know, Jesus and our lack of faith to me ever isn't the source of a problem, but he is definitely the foundational springboard to solve it. You know, I firmly believe that every single root problem or sorry, solution of everything that has brought me joy or happiness has come from God, from Jesus. Even snuggling with my cat or having my husband help logically talk me through something. The root of that is God showing himself to me. Mm. You know, I had somebody come up to me after first service. I didn't really want to say it in front of everybody, but didn't Jesus heal people in the Bible and didn't he just say a word and things changed? And what about today? Can't, can't God just take away depression if we pray for it? And it was such a good question, such an honest question, because I think we all struggle with that. And Alicia, I'm sure you've kind of prayed that God would just, just snap his fingers and it would just disappear, right? We all want that. And Jeff, as a pastor, as somebody who is a mental health professional, you, you do counseling. What do you, what do you say and how do you, as you watch this movie, is, are there things that, my experience as a pastor has been that there are people that I'll pray with and, and I will see those kind of miraculous things that will happen. And there are other people that struggle for a long time with that. And for me, as I look at them, I honestly don't see a difference in their faith. I don't see, it's not that one's less connected to God or one's more. How have you kind of processed through that? And how do you process with people who come in and counsel with you and say, hey, I want to be healed right now. Isn't that biblical? Don't I, can't I just pray this away? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, you wished it could be that easy, uh, that you could just end it in one little visit, and then they'd be good to go. Uh, and that was part of the part that I noticed in this movie, that it was, everything had a uh, kind of a, a process almost. You saw these balls going through this, and, then, and, and so I thought, boy, they're doing a really good job. And a part of what we battle with, I think, is our wanting them to be better for us, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned yeah. that. So I, I don't know if it's a situation where we can sit here and say, because God can do anything. God can literally at any time do whatever he wants, but I think he's giving us, given us tools. And I like what you said about the control panel. As we mature, as we get older, those nuances to not only how we see ourselves, but how we see others outside of ourselves um, be, be, takes on new meaning. So a lot of times when we get irritated with somebody or if we get impatient with somebody, that may be just 
something that's going on inside of us that we feel like if I can just control them, then subconsciously, then I'll be able to control some of the things that are going on inside of me. Well, these are our panelists. If you have questions or comments for any of us, you're more than welcome to ask. And I see that Randy already has, has somebody ready to go. Hi, Ashton. Hi, Ashton. Okay. Um, so my question is kind of, at the end of the movie, all, like half the personality of Ireland start falling down, who fall Ireland falls down, and you have to rebuild up those personalities, the personality of Ireland. How do you think he makes us us? while still being with God in that way, keeping ourselves whole. So I'm hearing you say, as we mature, how do we hang on to what's important without uh, not letting go of what's important, exactly. but also letting go of the stuff that needs to be let go of? Is that kind of it, what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, because you have to rebuild, but they're rebuilt different. They're not rebuilt the same. Yeah. So how does that kind of work with our connection with God? Love it. Yeah. Um, one thing I noticed about the film was that there was a lot of space for them to build more islands. And I think just as the panel expands, I think that there can be more islands. And to make that the metaphor, of, we can still have these islands that are kind of our, our, the, the, who we are, or who our personality is built upon. But those may even lose power, as in that film, but it may be as another one builds up in a less traumatic situation, is kind of how I see that situation and maybe there's sometimes that islands do need to to go maybe there are things that that jesus wa does want to go ahead and get rid of in our life but i always think that jesus fills those voids too with other things jeff do you have any 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 insight with that you want to share well i think most of the wives in here would wish that some of those islands would go away for their husbands <laughs> but uh but if you notice, though, at the end of the film, the islands that came back were more integrated. They actually mm -hmm. had other pieces that were from those other personalities. I think personality is a very, by the way, you bring up a very, very important piece to mental health, and that's personality. Mm -hmm. And personality is still being, it's like a frontier that we still don't know a lot about. But, um, you know, having, having mature, nuanced uh, decisions and how you work with your personality is important. So uh, Jeff wrote on, uh, on our, on our uh, chat, he said, uh, society says women cannot be angry and men cannot be sad. And I think that is a part of uh, American culture to, to a large extent. And uh, I think, Jeff, we can all agree that's not true in either case. Um, not this Jeff. Not that Jeff. No. Yeah. <laughs> the Jeff that wrote that in, yeah. yes. Um, Another person uh, wrote online and said, uh, what about anxiety? Is it a kind of emotion too? Jeff, is anxiety an emotion or is it something different? Well, and that's, a good, that's a good point. Anxiety and even uh, depression, uh, those are more moods. Uh, they are actually brain s shifts. And we, we shouldn't look at anxiety like we look at fear. And we shouldn't look at depression like we look at sadness. So they're, they're much more along the line of moods. And uh, those, are, those are brain transitions that we, that we work through. So you, you kind of can't compare those two. There is sadness in depression, but there's other pieces to depression that may not ever look like sadness sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was interesting in the film that there's only joy, who's the only positive emotion versus all of those yeah. others. And I was like, is this something about the filmmaker, or could you say that there were more emotion, more positive ones besides joy? I think that's actually an interesting point because if yeah. you looked at that scene where sadness is providing Bing Bong with some comfort, some of the things she actually say are kind of positive. Like, oh, I know you had some fun with her. So mixed emotions can definitely happen, especially at the end of the film, the core memories come out as mixed emotions for complex beings. And I think one emotion can kind of breed another. If you looked at the end of the film, there were some people that had all of their emotions were the same people. Right. You notice that? Yeah. So I thought that was a clever way of, of saying of that. Like, that's, that. that's how we, when we yeah. grow up, we kind of normalize or... Uh, give even power to everybody, maybe? Because yeah, yeah. uh, is that what they were trying to say? Yeah. 
So I have one final question for us as a panel that came in from our online, um, our online group. It says, how do you allow negative emotions without allowing them to overtake your life? How do you, so how do you deal with, how do you engage with negative emotions without letting them take over or maybe turn into um, things that are bad um, and, and sinful? It's definitely a difficult thing, especially when you do have that anxiety and depression that kind of shifts your perspective a little bit. And it's a constant struggle, but that's why you have your friends and your family to kind of help balance that out and take the rose-colored lens off your glasses and helping prevent it from turning in, from sadness into depression is where you get that a little bit of perspective, I believe. I think that a lot of us go down different routes, like avoidance, mm. or some, some of us go down this uh, route of contrarian. I just I disagree just because I want to disagree. And, you know, sometimes people punish people with those, those little pieces of how they deal with certain fears or certain... And I think it's important. My daughter has something that I thought, I wish I had done when I was a parent. And I have two granddaughters that are very, very different from each other and love them both. And one tends to go down the road of stubborn, very stubborn, which I, I love, by the way. But once in a while, she says, she has to remind her, please use your big girl voice now. And I think sometimes we just have to remind ourselves from time to time when we see ourselves sliding one way, is to just remind ourselves we have other ways to handling and managing those emotions. I, I would say as well as the filmmaker, not a psychologist, but um, <laughs> that sometimes we need to be like Joy and realize that we need, uh, that we are sometimes the cause of our own problems um, and that we may need a big change in our life. Yeah. And I, can I add one more thing? I'm please sorry. Do. Um, and I think it's important not to judge yourself to have those negative emotions because then when you start judging yourself for having those negative emotions, then it just turns into a small snowball into rumination on all of it. Yeah. The reason why I decided that I wanted to show this particular movie is um, because I'm, a, I'm really concerned that within Christian circles, we really, really, really label people who don't have joy as somehow being less Christian, um, that their feeling is not, their feelings aren't valid because if they knew Jesus, they would have joy. Um, and so what happens is that when people start going through negative experiences, instead of coming to church, they, they stay away from church. And I think that's the exact opposite reaction that I'd like to see. In a family, in a healthy family, when people are going through trauma, the family gathers around them and holds them up and walks with them. And in our family here at church, I wanna be very clear, if you're going through trauma, you are wanted here. If you're not happy when you show up at church, that's okay. We want you here and we want to walk with you. And I want to encourage each one of you to make it your mission to walk with people wherever they're at when they come here to Whole Life Church. We want to view emotions as simply being emotions. That they're, they're, they're there to give us messages that will help us deal with the issues that we're facing. Jesus walked with so many people that were going through so much. And we can do the same. Amen. You know, after a sermon like this, sometimes it brings up feelings and thoughts inside yourself. And you may not know where to turn. Uh, what I want you to know is that we have a wonderful pastoral team here that are here to support you. Uh, we have Jeff, who's a, a counselor and able to, to talk to you. And of course, the rest of our pastoral team are here to, to support as well. So if you're looking for resources, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. And we'd be happy to resource you and help you whatever uh, life event you may be going through that we can help you with. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much that you do not condemn us for our feelings that you walk with us, that you offer us your hand to see us through. 
Help us to hold on to you, to trust you, and to know with that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So this next week, no Tuesday night movie. So if you show here on Tuesday, I'll probably be here, but there won't be a movie. So no, not on Tuesday, but it will be on Friday night, six o'clock right here. There'll be popcorn out there and all kinds of other good stuff. Um, and the maker of the movie, Lord Save Us From Your Followers, which if you haven't seen this documentary, it is absolutely fabulous. Dan Merchant will be here. Uh, he made the movie. He'll, he'll be here to take some questions. He'll be here next Saturday. We'll look forward to having him uh, join us. And, in, and next Saturday afternoon at three o'clock, um, we're going to be uh, showing uh, two new shows that he's the director and producer and writer of that are um, out, they just are coming out this month on Pure Flix. And so uh, there might even be some promotion stuff if you wanted to be able to watch that. So anyway, he'll talk to you about those new shows that he's producing. Um, it'll be a pretty good time. So uh, I shouldn't say pretty, it'll be a fantastic time. Let's, let's hype it a little bit more. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being a part of this family. I love you. Go love your world. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts, Speaking of Grace, and its companion, 15 with Andy, Randy, and Jeff, are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians, all focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.